Welcome back to part two of our series on Chinese migrant worker poetry. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I suggest you go back and listen to that one first. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that our podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access to podcast episodes, ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merchandise and other content. For example, our Patreon supporters can listen to all three parts of this series now, as well as an exclusive Patreon-only bonus episode that goes into more detail about the migrant worker home, some of the rioters that we discuss, and their influences. Join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. A quick content note that this episode includes some mention of suicide and self-harm. You might remember that this series is being produced and presented with the help of friend of the podcast, Jack Franco. So at this point, we'll hand back over to him. In our first episode, we discussed some of the difficulties in classifying Chinese migrant worker poetry as writing that balances personal history with political activism and social critique. In this episode, We'll talk about how poetry in China is a social practice and what that means, looking at a number of migrant worker poets, including the life and work of Shu Li Zhe, one of the most significant in recent years. We'll also take a trip to the Migrant Workers' Home, a self-organized space run by and for migrant workers living in the urban village of Pitsun, on the outskirts of Beijing. All of this relates to how poetry as an art form has been historically conceived in China, which McGill van Crevel, professor of Chinese literature at Leiden University in the Netherlands, explains. Yeah, what can we expect of a Chinese poet through the ages? That, that's a fantastic question, um, you know, on the, on the importance of poetry in, in Chinese culture and society. And so, you know, my first very cheeky answer would be we can expect everything from them. Why is this? Because poetry as a social practice in China was basically, especially in antiquity and sort of, you know, the imperial time, so up to the 20th century, but continuing today, in fact, is a very occasional art, right? And this is not in any sense a pejorative thing to say. Parting with a friend, I'm going to write a poem. You know, visiting a faraway friend, I'm going to write a poem. Getting a new job, I might write a poem. My daughter graduating from high school, I might write a poem. And so on and so forth. And so this is a way of perhaps indicating how ubiquitous poetry is in Chinese society. It's entirely normal uh, for Chinese children, and yes, we're talking about a cultural elite, but a fairly large also in, in percentage numbers cultural elite, for their children to learn by heart several hundreds of famous poems from the imperial era. McGill is clear that poetry plays a far wider role in Chinese society than we might be used to in other countries. But China's poetic tradition also goes far beyond just being an occasional art. You know, poetry is an industry. Poetry is a sort of very thriving, bubbly thing in China, culturally hugely important. And then the notion of industry and sort of appropriating that to reflect on migrant worker poetry, even though it holds for the, for the larger picture... That is a very instructive way of looking at it. Now, going back to the more sort of culturally specific Chinese situation, what can we expect of a Chinese poet? Um, if I'm going to try and be less universal about that, I might say things like speaking truth to power. I might say things like lament for the suffering of the common folk, to which the poet very definitely doesn't belong because they're a, you know part of a cultural elite. So, you know, some of China's most famous poets, Du Fu, uh, among them, are famous for just that, right? Are famous for their ability to write about the horrors of war, even as, or perhaps especially as, they found themselves in a relatively privileged position in that they survived, in that they had the wherewithal to survive, to move around when that was necessary, etc. 
speaking truth to power as an age-old tradition, probably going back to the person who's commonly seen as sort of the first archetypal Chinese poet. The poet McGill mentioned, Du Fu, is perhaps China's most important classical poet during the golden age of the Tang Dynasty in the 8th century. He was a civil servant, as was expected of his social class, but spent much of his life on the road, unsettled by war. But China's poetic tradition was just as rich in the 20th century. Then you've got People's Republic of China, orthodox, high socialist poets like He Jingzhi, who wrote the Song of Lei Feng, which is basically a totally utopian Maoist ideal of the new Chinese person who consists mostly of self-sacrifice. You know, but then you might also find people in Guiyang and in Beijing in the late 70s when underground literature was sort of about to surface after the Cultural Revolution, posting their poetry, pasting it actually, literally, um, the Guiyang troupe in 1978, just after, you know, when, when the mausoleum for Mao Zedong was being erected in the same Tiananmen Square that we've seen recur in Chinese history, pasting their poetry on the walls of the building site there. A couple of months later, the group in Beijing pasting their poetry on, you know, city walls in various places in Beijing. So that is still a very political undertaking, even as these people were saying, we are reclaiming poetry to be an individual thing, to be a cultural thing, to not just be politics. Then you could move on to Yin Li Tuan and the lower body poetry group around the year 2000, totally irreverent, fearless, you know, not interested in politics, writing about um, heroin junkies in Beijing, right? Um, sex workers, that sort of thing, crashing through all kinds of taboos on the cultural scene, being hated and misunderstood <laughs> by everybody and their brother. And then you could turn to migrant worker poetry and still talk about poetry as a social practice in China. So that really drives it home, right? You see this, the muchness of it, the complexity of it, the diversity of it. And that's why I'm not ashamed of that metaphor of poetry being part of the cultural DNA of China. This idea of poetry that speaks truth to power, that depicts experiences of exploitation and injustice, are themes that link today's migrant workers to China's poetic tradition, such as the Book of Songs, whose earliest works are as much as 3,000 years old. Now, if you're going to situate this migrant worker poetry going back into Chinese cultural history, then I've seen people and people that I respect who will claim with some justification that there is, in fact, very direct linkage to the Book of Songs, uh, the Book of Odes, this collection, this anthology of songs that are, you know, allegedly come from the common folk. Of course, you need to sort of think about, well, how exactly did they come from the common folk if the common folk at that particular time probably was illiterate, right? Um, so how did that happen? And then, very interestingly, we find the notion of poem gatherers who were officials at the court who would go sort of among the people to gather these texts to find out what people were talking about and perhaps also to actually gather these folk songs. And then, you know, this linkage is established between that poetry of the common folk lamenting the horrors of war, lamenting the horrors of, you know, famished existence, the lamenting poverty, sadness, sorrow, um, impotence in the face of greater powers than yourself, be they political, be they natural, be they whatever. And I can see why, and at the same time, what I see is that that linkage is being romanticized. Right, so great, here today we have an incarnation of something that is part and parcel of our culture and that now speaks back to us about the post-socialist era. Well, yes, it's, it's debatable to say the least, but I can see the connection and, uh, and, and yeah, I think it is justified, but it comes with a couple of question marks. What McGill mentions here in relation to famished existences, sorrow and impotence in the face of greater powers, is evident in the lives of many migrant worker poets and migrant workers more generally. Shu Li Zhe is one such poet who dealt with these themes. Like Zhang Xiaochong, Shu was also a worker from a rural family who went to work on the assembly lines. Conditions at Foxconn in Shenzhen, where Shu worked, were so grueling that they led to a spate of suicides in the 2010s, with a dozen workers dying by suicide in 2010 alone. In 2014, just a few days after he had signed a new Foxconn contract, Xu would join them, taking his own life by jumping off a building. 
Here, McGill reads his translation of I Speak of Blood by Shu Li Zhe. I speak of blood. I speak of blood, for I have no choice. I'd prefer to chat about the wind, the flowers, the snow, the moon, about dynasties of old and the classical poetry found in spirits. But reality means I can only speak of blood. Blood with its source in rented rooms like matchboxes, narrow, cramped, sunless, the year round, squeezing in the battler boys and battler girls, wives gone astray and husbands far from home, guys from Sichuan hawking spicy soup, old people from Henan selling trinkets on street side blankets, and then me, toiling all day to survive and opening my eyes at night to write poetry. I speak to you of these people, I speak of us, Ants struggling through the swamp of life, one by one, drops of blood walking the battler's road, one by one, blood chased away by city guards or wrung out by machines, scattering insomnia, disease, job loss, suicide along the way. Words exploding one by one in the Pearl River Delta, in the belly of the motherland, Dissected by reams of paperwork like seppuku blades, I speak of all this to you. And even as my voice grows hoarse and my tongue breaks off, I will tear through the silence of this era. I speak of blood and the sky will shatter. I speak of blood and my mouth turns bright red. Shu Li Zhe explicitly links himself to China's literary heritage but in contrast to the scholars that McGill mentioned earlier, who link migrant worker poets to their classical predecessors, Shu's reality means he is unable to speak in the terms of that poetry. He would prefer to draw more classical motifs of wind, flowers and the moon, but as he says, he has no choice. He can only speak of blood, which itself symbolises the struggles of migrant worker life, not to mention that blood is not even just symbolic but also a literal part of the violence they experience. So I'm sort of trying to play a trick on you here because what I'm about to say about Xu Li Zhi really somehow doesn't totally match this poem. What is this poem? This poem is an angry poem. It's a political poem, not politically sensitive in in, in the sense of saying, you know, I rise up in revolt and let's overthrow the government, whatever, none of that, but it's political in the description of, shall we call them asymmetrical power relations? Shall we call it inequality? That sort of thing. Uh, it's heartrending. It's it's angry, right? And the reason that I did want to read it, even though I have a picture of this poet Xu Li Zhi, that is a bit more complex than a straightforward kind of you know mapping of the experience onto the poetry, onto the literary pre- representation is the way that he has been read. You know, the image of Xu Li Zhi has been taken by many people as a straightforward miniature for the story of migrant worker literature, migrant worker poetry in China. And I think that is just a little too easy. But I get it. I I understand how this has happened. And for that, we need to look at his life and we need to look at what people like to read about. And if we look at his life, we see a young man in Guangdong province, so actually in the Pearl River Delta, well, more or less, you know, in, in that same province already, growing up in a rural area, um, being a kid that loved going to school from, from a very young age. His elder brother at one point said, you know, something to the effect of, Xu Li Zhi really not being suited to, to rural life, to growing up as a farmer, um, trying to make his way to the city, having to make his way to the city. He completed high school, but then, you know, needed to go out and sort of um, get out there and start making money, but also seeing this as an opportunity because what he wanted was a job in a library. What he wanted was to be a writer, was to, you know, somehow have a connection with literature, um, a bookstore perhaps. But what he got was an assembly line job at Foxconn, which is, you know, a uh, Taiwanese electronics manufacturing company, um, Taiwanese headquartered with most of its 
plants, manufacturing plants in mainland China, and Foxconn has become sort of the epitome of um, the cruel labor regime uh, that comes with that kind of uh, organization, including the well-known Foxconn suicides. And this is when, in the, especially in the 2010s, employees at Foxconn started killing themselves in large enough numbers to be noticed and doing this in ways that were noticed as embodied protest, if you will. It's a very Im- um, academic way of putting it, basically sort of you know jumping off of a high building in order to make a point, right? Even if that's the end of your life. And Xu Liuzhi jumped off um, of the ledge, the ledge of a 17th floor window uh, in a high rise close to the Foxconn plant where he was employed at the tender age of 24. So he lived from 1990 to 2014, and that was it. And when he did this, there was this explosion of publicity. It was unimaginable. First in China. So the the Shenzhen Evening News had a full page on this otherwise totally nondescript, um, you know, regular run-of-the-mill powerless person. And yes, this was because he was a poet. The world over, in China no different than anywhere else, people have been fascinated by the death of the capital P poet, right? Or the artist, capital A artist, preferably by their own hand and preferably at a young age, right? There's a romantic romantic ideal that is incredibly powerful that has not gone away that, that just makes us, and I mean a very diverse and varied audience, uh, including, you know, totally untrained readers, highly professional readers and everything else, you know, get really excited about the death of the poet or the death of the artist. And I think in this case what happened, because we've seen hullabaloo about the death of the poet in China in other cases, but this was way bigger also internationally, and that's because there was a third element that came in, and that is we have a suicide, we have a poet slash artist, but we also have this figure of the migrant worker, of the subaltern subject, of the precarious worker, of the person who's at the very bottom of the global capitalist food chain, of the romanticizable but also sort of scarily feel-good image of these people wearing yellow helmets and they look like ants because the picture is one of a building site that is the size of, you know, two railway stations. Or these people, again, quote-unquote, shackled, but actually sometimes almost physically shackled to the assembly line, wearing these uniformizing sterile suits, right, the anti-dust stuff, because the iPhones and the iPads that you're putting together in the Foxconn factory, we can't have any dust in there, so the the workshop's probably being conditioned, etc. And so these three things together, a suicide by a young person who was a poet or artist, he had a blog, right? He published his poetry on a blog, wasn't widely recognized during his lifetime. And then third, this increasingly visible person, increasingly visible in China, but also in the world at large, of, of the migrant worker. McGill sees his poem as a challenge to the mainstream image that has been created of Xu Lijia after his death in 2014, that goes beyond both the romantic ideal of the suffering poet or a simple look into the life of 300 million migrant workers. What I find noteworthy and, and in a way tragic is that you know his story has been turned into this straightforward miniature of the migrant worker story, but actually if you read the collected works, right, which were put together after his death. If he hadn't killed himself, this wouldn't have happened, right? That's not a cynical comment. It's just an observation. So, you know, I read the collected works. Uh, it's, you know, what, about 250 pages of poetry, a young man. And you see that there is a very large component in this poetry that is not at all to do with socio-political issues, that is not to do with activism, not to do with anger over the way society treats the migrant workers, but that is pretty straightforward, you know, good, clean, existential angst. He has a poem about self-harm that is is totally grueling, and the external forces, so to speak, that we might want to mobilize to explain his bitter fate, they're nowhere in sight in this poem. Whereas in the poem by Zheng Xiaochong, or in this poem I speak of blood by Xu Liuzhi himself, yes, they are inside. These things are visible. We can see that this is about power relations in society, that it's about inequality. 
And that makes it a bit hard for me to accept that Shulija has become this sort of token, this emblem of the migrant worker's story, because I think it doesn't do him justice as a poet or as a human being. And it risks kind of homogenizing that picture to the point where it doesn't really teach us anything and it actually essentializes these people. Despite the intrinsically isolating nature of precarious migrant labor and their risky legal status, migrant workers are still able to self-organize and forge networks of solidarity. Zhang Xiaochong dedicated a poem to a 2016 protest when a hundred migrant workers camped out in a Beijing underpass to demand unpaid wages. You can find a mini documentary about the protest with a reading of Zhang's poem, Needing Workers Demanding Their Pay, in the show notes. In the poem, Zhang writes about the workers. They're constantly put together, arranged, into an electronics factory, ant's nest, a toy factory, honeycomb. The existence of these high concentrations of workers in these ants' nests and honeycombs also creates a possibility for bonds of solidarity. Migrant workers are far from passive victims, and one example of this resistance is the migrant workers' home in Pizun, Beijing. If we're looking at migrant worker poetry and at the community building that happens around it, then the migrant worker home in Pizun, which is um, a village on the outskirts of Beijing to the northeast. It's actually an example of this quote-unquote village in the city phenomenon where people you know, started living because the rents were affordable and they could commute into the city to sort of do their work. And the population in a, a small number of years grew from uh, something like 2,000 to 30,000 or thereabouts. So, you know, a factor of 10 or 15, something like that. Now, the Migrant Workers' Home in Pitun is an NGO that makes it its business to emancipate precarious workers, many of them migrant workers. But it also includes people who sort of, you know, who were laid off from state factories, whatever. It's not necessarily just migrant workers, but many of them are migrant workers. And it was founded by a small number of people who were actually migrant workers that came to Beijing in the late 1990s, with high hopes of making it as artists, as musicians, as um, stand-up comedians in the Chinese variety of, uh, of a, a Chinese variety of that particular art form. And like many other people, they found their hopes um, frustrated and they didn't quite make it as artists and entertainers and found themselves doing precarious labor, but stuck together and ended up working together through connections with a bunch of people sometimes refer to as the new left, especially um, academics and other authors who have a particular political position. So now we're we're talking about, you know, two decades ago when China was more or less uh, clearly heading in the direction of a much more capitalist uh, and open vision of the world than it has today under Xi Jinping. So these new left Uh, intellectuals kind of teamed up with these migrant workers and with other organizations that were emerging, for example, for the protection of the rights of female migrant workers at the time, and founded this NGO. And the thing that distinguishes them from many other organizations that work for the emancipation of precarious workers, and sometimes specifically migrant workers, is that they try to do this through what they call cultural education, in Chinese And that is actually clear in the background of its founding members, who were musicians and comedians. The Migrant Workers' Home provides concrete material help to its population, such as free libraries, workers' rights classes, or schooling for the children of migrant workers, who, as we mentioned in part one, aren't allowed to attend local state schools as they don't have the correct urban household registration status. But its main mission is developing a rich cultural life for migrant workers, As it says in the home's mission statement, without our culture, we have no history. Without our history, we have no future. So, for instance, the intro song you've been hearing in this series is by the Migrant Worker Home's New Labour Art Troupe. Far from being a Blairite tribute band, its members are all former migrant workers, like the singer Lu Liang, who came from Shandong province to work in the coal mines. You can find a link to a short documentary about the art troupe on the webpage for this episode. The link is in the show notes. In 2014, the Migrant Workers' Home set up the Pizun Literature Group and began publishing its own literary journal. How this group works is 
one of the um, you know core people at the home, the manager uh, called Xiao Fu or Fu Chou uh, Chou Yun, she realized that people wanted this, that people were interested in literature and wanted to try and write themselves and just you know wanted to learn basically wanted some sort of education to happen in that particular realm. So she advertised this on social media and you know people got in touch with her. One person in particular, Zhang Hui, an academic who's now a professor at Peking University, who started going to Pitun um, once weekly, I think, basically to lecture on literature, on culture, on anything that these people wanted to know about, and to combine this actually with a workshop type of approach. And this is something that happens in other places as well, right? Writing workshops. As part of a social movement,、uh, as part of political movements, and so on and so forth, it's not necessarily a political movement here. I'm quite ready to say that it was not, because people were careful of the red lines and you know had to tread carefully because of censorship and political sensitivity. How this group works, and it's been ongoing. It's almost a decade. Can you imagine that? Roughly once a week, an academic or a cultural official, you know, this could include people representing the Communist Party, to talk about. The Party Congress and what was the most important message、uh, that we need to work on. It could include practitioners like famous writers and you know movie makers, perhaps. It should also be pointed out, however, that the relationship the migrant workers' home has with local government is far from straightforward. These people are expert at working with the municipal government, with whom they're going to have to work because the municipal government is going to be in charge of that area. And there have been very sort of precarious moments where the village was about to be bulldozed. Didn't happen, you know, over the last decade or so. And just recently, for example, one of the cultural places of pride in that community that was the museum of migrant worker or really battler、uh, literature and art that they had set up on a shoestring budget in 2008, and that was there for 15 years, and is an incredibly Impressive, a moving place. Well, it's been shut down because the city is expanding, and there was no more room for the museum. And so they're thinking about, you know, rebuilding the exhibition farther away from Beijing, in other places where they are active.、Um, but you know, that is the sort of environment that you're working in. McGill has worked extensively with and on the Pitsun Literature Group, and one of its poets, Xiao Hai. Xiao Hai is a moderately successful poet who has received official scholarships and recognition. In McGill's essay "I and We in Pitsun," which you can find linked in the show notes, McGill quotes Xiao, who claims that in Pitsun he had finally found proof that a pure revolutionary era of friendship still exists. Solidarity and material stability, created by cultural education and exchange for free and for their own sake. Literature is seen as salvation, but not as an escape from work. As a way of making sense of life as a migrant worker and reclaiming, affirming their personal identity by putting their work at the center of their poetry, some of these themes are present in Xiao's 2018 poem, "When I Watched the World Cup, What Did I See?" Translated and read by McGill. So here is a poem by Xiao Hai, called "When I Watched the World Cup, What Did I See?" When I watched the World Cup, what did I see? The first time I stayed up to watch the World Cup, it was Colombia against England. Truth be told, I don't even know where Colombia is on this earth, but I do know that in Dongguan Hulmen, in the England football outfit factory, my workmates work year-round, day shifts and night shifts, racing to make those jerseys. A couple millions for every batch. They make them by the hundreds, thousands, millions. And before they know it, they've been at it for many, many years. As for the Colombia jerseys, I've made those too in Sudo Wudong, but the Pearl River Delta and the Yangtze Delta, as the workshop of the world, I only heard about that a couple years ago. Wanda and Adidas and Coca-Cola and their million-dollar moving ads on the pitch have nothing to do with me. Youth slipped away is the only thing that's mine. I looked up and out the window. Two breakfast stalls had set up shop. As darkness lifted, a sleepless bachelor was on a treasure hunt near the trash. The losing team left the pitch. 
The winners kept doing victory laps. All that was left was the workers, making those jerseys year upon year, day upon day, silent and voiceless, slogging on with no breaks. Like in Wu Xiao's poem, Sundress, which we discussed in the previous episode, Xiao's poem here brings together the consumer's experience of the product, in this case the multi-billion dollar a year football industry, and the workers who make it possible. The poem tells the story of Xiao's first experience of anticipation for a World Cup game, yet he can't avoid seeing in the victory laps and TV ads a thing he knows intimately, the football shirts Chinese migrant workers make themselves. His poem puts his workers back on football's biggest stage. For Xiao, the shirts are his workmates above all, no longer Colombian or English. When the 90 minutes are over, the losing team left the pitch, the winners kept doing victory laps. All that was left was the workers making those jerseys, year upon year, day upon day, silent and voiceless, slogging on with no breaks. The feeling of friendship and solidarity Xiao found in Pitsun, Megyul argues, can help us read and support working class literature more generally, across languages and traditions. This is really what came home to me, I I guess, the most powerfully, you know, like a ton of bricks um, in this research over the years, what has come out to me is that this is about identification. It is it is a way to secure your place in the sun, even if that's just two minutes a day. It is a way to to be a person that is identifiable with other persons in different ways than being the next person in line on the assembly line. Yeah, it is a way of identifying actively and sharing that and exchanging that. Also connecting, if only in spirit, and sometimes actually very practically, using translation software, whatnot, with other movements across the border, right? Other poetry movements that are part of social movements. What they have in common, these poetries, right? Social concern and social aspiration. So it's not just identification per se, full stop. It is identification that comes with social concern on issues that you see in front of your eyes in the society that you're a part of. And with the aspiration of emancipating marginalized groups, vulnerable groups, subaltern groups. That's all we have time for in today's episode. Join us in part three, where we'll look at the underground world of China's unofficial poetry journals, questions of censorship, and the work of another Chinese migrant worker poet, Mu Cao, whose work asks questions about who gets to be included within the field of working class literature and who doesn't. We also have a bonus episode where we go into more detail about some of the topics we discussed in the main episodes, like the relationship between migrant worker poetry and the Chinese state, the new labor art troupe whose music we're using for these episodes, and the international reception of Chinese migrant worker poets like Zhang Xiaochong and Xu Li Zhe. That bonus episode will be available soon, exclusively for our supporters on Patreon. It is only support from you, our listeners, which allows us to make these podcasts. So if you appreciate our work, please do think about joining us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. In return for your support, you get early access to content, as well as ad-free episodes, exclusive bonus content, discounted merch, and more. And if you can't spare the cash, absolutely no problem. Please just tell your friends about this podcast and give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. If you'd like to learn more about migrant worker poetry in China, then check out the webpage for this series where you'll find images, a full list of sources, further reading, and more. We've also got a great selection of books available about Chinese history in our online store, and you can get 10% off them and anything else using the discount code WCHPODCAST. Link in the show notes. Thanks also to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks go to Jameson D. Saltzman, Jazz Hands, Fernanda Lopez Ojeda, and Jeremy Cusimano. Our theme tune for these episodes is A Young Man from the Village by the New Labour Art Troupe from the Migrant Worker Home on the outskirts of Beijing. Thanks to them for letting us use it. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Jesse French. Anyway, that's it for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed the episode and thanks for listening. Yen
填满自己的口袋。